Hi, I'm Dr. Chase Cunningham. Welcome to the Zero Trust Forum. Uh, we're going to talk with our panelists today about Zero Trust platforms and how they enable organizations to get more secure in a world that requires Zero Trust. So with that being said, I'd like to start off and throw a question to the mix. Really, how do you see the market as it stands right now around Zero Trust capabilities that map into this sort of platform category? And I'll start with Sharon. Uh, okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, waking up uh, so early to accommodate my uh, uh, time zone. So uh, delivering zero trust requires a, a platform. It's not a, a portfolio a, a approach and uh, zero trust cannot be a, a rip and a replace kind of uh, thing. So uh, there are uh, several uh, critical capabilities that needs to be met around the uh, workloads, people, devices, and so on each vendor might have a very good solution to address a specific, maybe more than a one or two aspects, but it requires all the capabilities in really to really implement it and solve the pain points to begin with. So I don't want to steal everybody else thunder, I'll just say that there must be a stack of uh, multiple solutions that are well orchestrated uh, together and uh, integrated in order to uh, deliver a, a real value to the customers. And obviously I would be happy to elaborate more about it uh, in the next uh, uh, couple of questions. So Kumar, would you like to give a little bit of run through on sort of where you see the, the industry as it sits right now with this need for platforms? Absolutely. As uh, Sharon was mentioning that, you know, the, the, there is definitely a need for the platform. Uh, but one of the things that we are seeing is that, uh, you know, people are just trying to slap zero trust on top of what they have. And that does not evolve. I think the, there has to be a fundamental change in how you look at, I mean, the zero trust is really a change in the philosophy. I mean, there is no more good guys, bad guys. You're, you're essentially eviscerating that to say that it is flow by flow and how and where does the flow go? Where does the flow come from? And uh, in some sense, uh, I still don't see a complete change in the strategy of how networks are being deployed that would be uh, able to be completely zero trust. Uh, people are still trying to slap something on top of existing networks to call it zero trust. So I do believe that there is going to be a change in how uh, zero trust is going to get adopted in the market as it goes along, as people start looking at it to say, for example, if I implement zero trust without uh, in a, a root of trust authentication on a certain things, you actually create a bigger problem because now you are assuming you know, two different philosophies and you cannot satisfy both. So, I mean, again, as Shara would say, I would definitely yield ground to some of the other participants, but I do think that the market needs to dramatically shift to the philosophy change rather than just slapping something on top of it. Interesting. So uh, open it up to the rest of the forum. Gil, your thoughts on how we're, how we're sort of sitting in a spot where platforms are a requirement, not an option. Yeah, I would definitely concur with that. You know, zero trust needs to be applied across identities, devices, APIs, uh, data infrastructure and networks. And, you know, just taking either or one of those and solving it does not address you know, the, the security, uh, the required security uh, for the modern enterprise as a whole. Uh, so platforms are, uh, you know, going to be required. And, and I want to piggyback on Sharon and say that um, no single vendor will be able uh, to address all of them. So having the entire security ecosystem uh, play together um, in, in terms of, of access, uh, but also inventory and trust, uh, this is really going to be instrumental in, in seeing real value in, in zero trust, as opposed to, like Umar said, just slapping the word zero trust on whatever you have handy at that specific moment. So that, uh, that actually takes me to a pretty interesting point. Uh, if we're, if we're in a space where everyone kind of agrees that you can't just slap a zero trust sticker on something and call it a zero trust capability. When you do have a platform that can enable zero trust, how are you as the vendor working with an organization to optimize what they might have already invested in that helps them get towards the end state of zero trust? In other words, we are, we're offering platform type capability here, but a lot of organizations already have a lot of things that are zero trustee in nature. How, how do you think that we solve the problem of not 
ripping and replacing all that old uh, old uses, uh, old infrastructure, that type of system. And Yal, I'll start with you with this one. Thank you. So I think um, it, it is eventually going to be a replacement of existing technology. It's a matter of how um, conveniently can the vendor accommodate a gradual migration. Um, and it really depends on where the customer wants to achieve zero trust. It can be between users and resources. It can be between devices and other resources. And based on that case by case, the zero trust vendor should be able to solve them one by one in a way that doesn't throw away the spending that the customer has already put on their existing infrastructure. Sandeep, uh, your thoughts on this? How do we how do we help folks move into not rip and replace, but really optimize what they already have as they progress going forward? Well, review to AR, you know, from what we are seeing, probably obviously in the last 12 months, the level of awareness with uh, the CISO community and the security and risk management professional community has really gone up. But how customers are adopting when we kind of work with them? Obviously, they could have something new for refresh. But more importantly, what we're also seeing is the supply chain adoption. So essentially what they traditionally left it out in the open for non-public networks available for their supply chain applications, they're slowly thinking that, hey, after the solar winds and other attacks, they're thinking that, hey, can we kind of get the, the extended supply chain into a, into a fabric? Now, obviously, this is a much more harder problem, but, but some customers are starting that journey. Others, obviously, who they have something new for replacement like a VPN or existing infrastructure, they are looking to see how they can switch uh, without uh, having to completely rip and replace. But uh, as we said, this is a this is a migration and, and this will continue in its, uh, and it will keep transforming the coming quarters to come. That is what I see. So if this is a, if this is a migration and this is a marathon, which I think we're all in agreement on, what do we think is probably the first thing that an organization should start with to get towards that, uh, that move to zero trust. I think a lot of folks talk about users and identity and devices, and then you have some organizations that are a little bit further along that are into the network and sort of uh, micro segmentation approach. And in your opinion, as, as folks out there doing the work and actually implementing these platforms, where should they start? And uh, uh, Gail, I'll start with you here. So it's important to keep in mind that zero trust, you know, it's, it's eventually, um, a means and not an end and you know we all strive to be more secure uh, all the time but uh, there is no uh, one security program that covers uh, everything and prioritization is key when running your security org now to address your question um, it really depends on what the need is. I'll give an example uh, in March when uh, so many enterprises had to um, to uh, move very quickly to be working from home, uh, that very urgent need uh, presented itself, and you know, zero trust network access uh, became their top priority because that really aligned with the business needs. Um, so I would make the first step towards that, whichever use case is more urging from the business perspective, because that's the end of the day. The, the goal for every security organization to, to facilitate the business. And that's where the motivations are or should be. Interesting. So Kumar, when, in your opinion, where do we start? Uh, I totally agree with uh, you know what Gil and Sandeep have been saying. I think what we have been at Privafile looking at is a little bit uh, very similar on opportunistic basis. So there's a large bank that just started a hybrid cloud project where they have completely on data centers, they were getting out, and this was new to them. And uh, you know they started embracing the philosophy of zero trust, or so at least one section of their network, if you will, even though they haven't migrated to the rest of the network, is starting to look at uh, how to implement the approach using zero trust. And that is really where we are partnering with them and helping empower them. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, you know the rest of the network continues to stay traditional, but you know the 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 heads of the security are aware of what needs to happen. So they are looking at how to bring in some of the same philosophies back into the rest. But that is going to take some time. Again, it's uh, like you said, it's a marathon. Not you know we cannot finish the sprint in 2021. So all of the different security vendors who go in and you know one company cannot solve all the problems need to start making sure that their solution plugs into that infrastructure and you know some kind of a plug and play. 
exists, the identity providers, the network providers, the you know all of that needs to kind of plug in together, and that is really what we are seeing. The other area where you know uh, we are seeing a relook at how we can do hardware root of trust identity, and again you know thanks and no end to the solar winds hack is how you could start implementing root of trust at the hardware level and start implementing zero trust from going forward. But again, those are hardware products that are just being developed right at the supply chain level. It's going to take a few years before they get to hit the market. But I see definitely people starting to look at how do they change the philosophy. And uh, But you're right, we are being opportunistic right now as opposed to you know evangelize the whole company. Interesting. Uh, any other thoughts from the group here, Sharon or Eyal? So in my opinion, you know, trying to be practical and obviously uh, Gil is right, you need to decide where to start and so on, but there are certain elements that are always true for a zero trust uh, project. You need to start what, by identifying the relevant sensitive data and assets that uh, need to be in scope for the, the project. Then you need to map the flows of your uh, sensitive data and how they are related. And if you're focusing on users, do it there. If you're focusing on applications, do it there. Uh, build those micro perimeters that are required in order to create those uh, enclaves where you set uh, the different uh, policies and enforce it, it. Continue to monitor and eventually it's a, a process within the uh, organization, a training, awareness, policies, and, uh, um, and vice versa. Obviously, I would argue that you would need to start with a certain uh, technology. Uh, others would try to promote something else. But I think that eventually we will get to a, a very similar uh, point in terms of our capability and ability to actually to achieve uh, through zero trust uh, uh, posture. Yeah, I would like to add to that, that something very unique happened during COVID-19. When everybody had to migrate to, to migrate to move to work from home, many organizations had to compromise on their security in order to allow all the workers to connect into their corporate resources. And now when we're looking towards hopefully the end of COVID, IT teams are looking to plan their either zero trust or remote access solutions to enable a hybrid model of either working from the office or from remote without compromising on security. But there is another thing that they are not willing to compromise on anymore, and this is performance, which is very often a trade-off between security and user experience or application performance. And what we believe at Cato is that in order to deliver a zero trust that doesn't compromise on security or performance, the zero trust has to be the network itself and not a solution that comes on top of the network or that runs outside the corporate network. And it's achievable if you have a SASE platform. And we're seeing more and more customers demanding those capabilities now. Interesting. So that, that, uh, that follows on to another point. Uh, this is a very common conversation that happens for me on the workshop side is, is zero trust uh, specifically using platform type capability. Is this really only for big enterprise or is this something that's also applicable to small and mid-sized business, which numerically is actually much larger uh, than, than big enterprise. And I, I'm really interested to see what y'all think as far as do we do ZT platform for everybody or just for, for the big E and Sandeep, I'll start with you here. Very interesting question. Uh, we have been around for a while at InstaSafe and we have seen the evolution from, you know, mid-sized customers all the way to enterprise customers. The interesting part about mid-sized enterprise customers is the fact that they've traditionally invested in, uh, you know, hardware security solutions, right? So, and then with COVID-19 coming up, they had to kind of dramatically ensure business continuity uh, problems are solved and to manage this trade-off between, you know, productivity and security, a zero trust solution really comes to their help. Obviously, SaaS is, is evolutionary there. But a zero trust uh, approach can immediately help solve this, stay productive, uh, ensure that the, the ZT network is the network and uh, not an overlay there. And then it is helping them. But yes, it's, it's, it's evolutionary and a long journey there, but it is tremendously helped a lot of mid sized enterprise companies worldwide. Sure, Sharon, what do you think? In my opinion, zero trust is important for everybody. The question obviously is about adaptation. Larger enterprises tend to understand the problem faster just because they are getting hurt more. 
but uh, eventually there's a long tail of uh, a risk that uh, is reaching the, the smaller organizations uh, as well. I think that uh, the uh, um, early uh, uh, generations of uh, uh, solutions, if we can call it uh, uh, this way, were more attuned to the larger organizations and we are starting to see now a, a more uh, packaged uh, uh, solutions that uh, meet requirements of uh, smaller uh, organizations uh, as well. Uh, I would love to have uh, a Zero Trust implemented uh, for my full mesh uh, Wi-Fi at home, for instance, without the need to go and uh, to, to work uh, so hard uh, myself. Um, so looking forward to yeah. see this uh, even uh, for uh, home users as well. Yeah. Any, anyone else in the group have thoughts on small business versus uh, big enterprise and ZT? I, I do. Uh, the, this is Kumar. Uh, thanks, Jay. So, uh, Privify, uh, interestingly, was exploring the small business, small medium business segment first, because that's really where we were positioning ourselves. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, early on we noticed is every single partner, our partners we started working with, uh, one of the transformations we see in the partners is rather than just becoming a hardware vendor or somebody who just throws a security solution over the top and say, here's a box, stick it in and move on and you know, a one-time charge. We see a lot of these partners now slowly evolving to become managed security service providers. So they actually become uh, for the small business because they cannot afford to have, as everybody is pointing out in the panel, they can't afford to have their own um, you know, security chief security officer or a security policy. What we see these partners evolving to is to become the uh, security experts for some of these small medium businesses when they started exploring new security solutions. And we've had some success with partners pushing zero trust into small medium enterprises. I agreed some of these are probably franchises you know, to, that, that can afford to do some of these right now, but with everybody going remote plus everybody you know, being mobile, this is certainly uh, starting to hit even in the small medium business. That's really what we are seeing on how the partners are transforming. Yeah, I think uh, hackers, you know, attackers continue to move downstream. So it's one of those things where if we have really good ZT for big enterprise and we have all these small businesses that aren't, they connect into big enterprise and we continue to, uh, you know, introduce the threats there. So I, I agree exactly. with everybody. I think it, yeah, it has to apply across the board. Um, following on to that, uh, every, since everyone on the, on the panel is a platform provider in the space, I, I always like to ask the question, uh, and I used to do these during my waves, is, What's the one thing you tell organizations to not do as they get into zero trust? And y'all, I'll start with you here. Well, uh, first of all, that's a that's a great question. What not to do? Um, I, I think my first recommendation would probably be not to try and get everything done overnight. They have to understand that there is a process here. Like my uh, colleagues here said, you need to identify or make sure that you identify the users and the assets and how the network is flowing in order to build the right zero trust model. But you also have to make sure that you have a good capability of monitoring and governing the zero trust that you're building. In regards to the previous questions of whether zero trust is, is fit for a small medium business, I think zero trust is even more challenging for the largest enterprises. This is where the networks get super complex well, there is a DIY mentality and best of breed that often causes enterprises to buy from vendors that don't necessarily have the best offering or a product or, a, or sorry, or a platform or a service at all, but portfolio products. And this is where they should really look into how they can choose a zero trust platform that can serve their needs. I think it's much more of a challenge to the largest fortune and global 2000 enterprises than to the small medium businesses. Interesting. Gil, what do you think is uh, one thing that you talk with folks about maybe not doing or at least being very aware of as they get into this space? So uh, I have seen a few customers uh, taking the uh, let's rip out uh, our legacy solutions and, and you know, uh, go all in for zero trust. Now, while uh, in the future, this is something that's very desirable. Uh, some of the great thing about these platforms is that they can live side by side with your existing solution and allow you to do a phase in phase out approach. Uh, no one needs to risk their business continuity uh, just to, you know, uh, meet the, the highest standards of security right away. There's a reason uh, things take time 
and and you know the the phasing phase out approach i think is is more advisable uh, especially given the fact that uh the the solutions or the 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 yeah the solutions can coexist inside an organization uh, so this is a, uh, you know, I love the enthusiasm, but uh, we all need to act responsibly when migrating the IT and the access posture of, of large enterprises. Yeah. So any other, uh, any other thoughts from the group on what not to do when you're getting in on zero trust? Uh, in, in my opinion, you know, understanding that zero trust is not a specific technology. It's uh, so there's not a zero trust uh, solution. It's a, a strategic approach. So I, in my opinion, the, the, the one recommendation that I would insist on when talking with uh, organizations that uh, are thinking about implementing it is to make sure that uh, they talk with uh, someone in their peer group, someone with uh, a similar uh, challenges, someone at the same size, someone with uh, similar footprint to, to learn uh, from uh, previous mistakes, to set very specific and realistic uh, goals that are uh, achievable so that uh, it would be possible to, to gain progress and uh, to do it. Uh, in my opinion, comparing with uh, other uh, projects that are more uh, canned and, you know, I'm building something, creating something, Zero Trust requires uh, a, a change. Uh, we've been doing uh, a networking and security for the past uh, 20, I'm doing it for the past 25 and 30 or, or, or more years. And I think that uh, uh, we see now a fundamental uh, change also due to the uh, fast acceleration on, on how uh, the IT stack uh, looks like. So don't start a project without talking with someone uh, similar to you that actually uh, started or, or did it um, to get uh, his point of view. That's, that's great. Um, follow on to that. When, when we're in a space where we're moving to this and we are uh, in most organizations going to be some form of kind of a hybridized model, uh, what is your particular opinion or approach to how platforms enable organizations to live in that sort of hybrid world? And I'll start with Kumar on this one. Uh, thank you, Chase. Uh, so uh, just to echo on one thing that Sharon was saying, I, I do agree that uh, when enterprises start looking at uh, uh, zero trust, I, we, one of the first things we want to do is educate them that this is not a project but a strategy change. So they need to look at it first and not just replace one firewall. But to come back to your uh, point on um, the uh, on a hybridized uh, strategy, yes, you know, zero trust easily translates into any hybrid environment. As some of the projects we were doing for a large bank would tell you that, even in a hybrid cloud environment, it is fairly easy to say how you start segmenting your traffic. Yes, your first chop is to start doing the micro segmentation, starting to look at which traffic is the one and uh, then see how the remote access solutions work with these to make sure that uh, you know if you have an existing solution that you are married to for at least some portion of your time how do we make that work with the existing solution if you are really looking to replace it how do we start looking to see what that change will bring in but even when you go into a hybrid cloud environment i think the most important thing for people to understand is that uh, you know when you are in a public cloud as an example a certain set of policies or known policies need to get put into effect uh, you know that you cannot take for granted because it is definitely open internet access but the education there for the zero trust is more to do with what kind of policies you need to put in place for each one of your different environments as opposed to a different strategy for each one so sandeep or y'all your thoughts on uh, on how we live in the hybrid world so the first thing the customers are realizing is that uh, there is a possibility uh, that, uh, you know, uh, security could be delivered to the cloud. That is to say, uh, we, we started as completely a cloud native uh, platform approach. So the traditional, you know, uh, approach of backhauling uh, and then uh, using the data center as the complete uh, security operations center, customers are realizing that there are options available now and then uh, plenty of options available. So that's the best part of the hybrid world. But yes, again, uh, hybrid is a is a is a is a, is a, is a multi you know pronged strategy you to pick up which is the best area to uh, start off we have seen customers who could migrate who have recently migrated their their sap and their core critical applications and then using a zero trust solution to ensure that access is end to end and more importantly uh, they are just not confining to just zero trust but also picking up areas of uh, overall identity access management 
uh, what they could not have probably covered incomplete. Now they're looking to see how they can do an end-to-end -end and application migration with a zero trust approach. So I want to add to that uh, an angle that I think we all overlooked so far in the discussion and what is happening to all those endpoints, all those laptops and, and mobile devices when they are not connected to the Zero Trust platform and through it to the resources that they need to get to. People take, took the working computers home. They are using them for other purposes during that time. And I think that organization need to be very aware of that and understand that in part of being exposed to the internet, not through the enterprise security stack, they're actually exposing their corporate devices to malicious attacks and to malicious software. And we need to provide IT teams and security teams with the capabilities to secure those devices for the general internet usage beyond the time when they connect to corporate resources. I think that's very critical. And if, if the Zero Trust platform can also enable that, like we do at Cato, there's a great benefit to that to the customer because they maintain the security posture even when the user is not accessing specific corporate resources. Uh, I, I agree with Ayal and, and you know, the more coverage you have on, on the devices and on anything that accesses the network, the better. And there's a, a reason why uh, corporate devices usually go through a secure web gateway even when users are not accessing uh, remote uh, applications, but the, the, the greatest benefit of uh, the migration and the moving to zero trust is not just the always be covered piece of it. It's more of a, you know, reduce the blast radius because when things will happen and, you know, malicious activity will fall between the cracks and it will because uh, no, uh, nothing's 100% safe. Uh, the, the fact that anybody everybody's getting the the absolute minimal amount of access they need uh, and that everything's being monitored and logged and recorded and you know there there are the tools to respond to malicious activity um, and again uh, a minimal required access posture is, is being taken uh, that I feel is even the bigger benefit of, of zero trust just because you know, things will go wrong. And when they do, uh, the damage needs to be minimized. So last question uh, for the group really is, where do we see things going as we continue to evolve? And ZT, uh, it's global now. I have conversation with people in Japan and Australia and India and the Netherlands and all over the world really about how this is uh, becoming a very real strategic approach for them. Where do you think that we are going to be by 2025 in this space around zero trust? And I'll, I'll start with Sharon. Okay, so um, that's, that's a great question. And uh, while I'll try uh, not to, uh, uh, to never predict uh, the future, I believe that uh, at least in this case, we will see zero trust uh, becoming uh, uh, such a, a basic uh, approach uh, to, to, to things that uh, is going to be a part of uh, everything that uh, um, we do develop, uh, buy, manufacture and, uh, and use. Uh, it's simply just uh, too, too good not to be uh, implemented. The fact that uh, it is being adopted, the fact that uh, legacy uh, uh, solutions are rebranded with a, a ZT kind of uh, addition, the fact that uh, consumers are asking for it just uh, uh, points that uh, it is something uh, of use and uh, useful. I'm sure that uh, I don't know if it will be 2025 or 2026 or, or you know, a couple of days uh, before that. But uh, eventually, it's going to be part of uh, everything that uh, we do and, and use in uh, cybersecurity. Sandeep, your thoughts? Well, I think the the world would definitely be a much more safer place by 2025. Is what I believe. You know, when the tax surface areas would have dramatically gone down. Uh, you know, things would have been a lot better, but obviously, you know, with the intent of, uh, with the advent of 5G, IoT, you know, the, the landscape is constantly changing, but where we are today, uh, the attack surface should have dramatically reduced, is what I see. And Gil? Um, so, you know, Gartner Research suggests that by 2023, almost half of all enterprises will have migrated uh, to ZTNA in some uh, shape or form. Uh, I believe uh, this trend is, is coming much 
faster at, at greater numbers. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, this COVID situation and the world shifting to working from home, uh, but also the rise in, in, you know, attacks and ransomware and both the payouts uh, per attack and the number of total attacks skyrocketed in a way very few have predicted. So I do feel like it's, uh, you know, the, the push and the, the trend is going to come uh, at bigger numbers and, and faster. Uh, and that, you know, by then, uh, the organizations that not that have not migrated will be, you know, the easier victims and, and you know, uh, the survival of the fittest will squeeze them out as this will become a, a very big business disadvantage and not just security. Interesting. Hey, y'all. Yeah, so I'll make a bold prediction um, and then we can watch it uh, five years into the future and see how I came out. But um, I, I think that everybody is going to embrace zero trust, but I think that the industry of the zero trust platforms itself is going to change. I predict that what has happened to the pure play SD1s, that they have either gone out of business or has been acquired by greater platforms is going to happen to ZTNA because it can't be a standalone, a standalone solution. It has to be a part of a greater SASE or whatever you call it platform that connects all the network assets, that secures them east, west, northbound, inbound, in all directions, that supports all the different edges, like people are saying here, it is a, essentially it's going to be a major feature inside a bigger platform and not a standalone solution. Interesting. And Kumar, wrapping it up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chase. So I, I will echo a few of the things that Gil said, and uh, I, I agree with uh, you know how this is going to evolve. I'm, not, I'm very bad at predicting timelines, but I do think it is going to come a lot faster than you know, 2025, 26, but um, you know, don't hold me to that. But the bigger thing there, I think, is that I would definitely see this being adopted in a way where uh, you have completely peer-to-peer flow-based authentication and access, irrespective of the network you're flowing through, irrespective of the devices you're going through. I completely see this as application-driven, peer-to-peer, flow-based authentication. Yes, I agree again with uh, what I was saying about, uh, you know, you're decimating SD-WAN kind of an environment or a pure play SD-WAN to not, but, but I think it will evolve to a point where irrespective of the network or the traffic you're on, you have completely peer-to-peer uh, authentication and flow-based access that now comp- takes micro-segmentation at the application level as opposed to just talking about it in the network play. All really great points. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, we're seeing amazing things going on in the world around Zero Trust. Great to have you guys here. Zero Trust platforms from the Zero Trust Forum. Looking forward to seeing the demonstrations. Thanks again. Thank you for the opportunity, Chase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Bye.